tragedy without a solution. Allen, Texas becomes the site of yet another massacre. Tonight, what we're learning of the police response, the Samaritans that save lives, and the shooter, including what's now leading investigators to probe if he subscribed to white supremacist ideology. Plus, we can all keep our guns, and the majority of us here in Texas are gun owners and gun owning families. But there are responsibilities that we all have. Begging for help, activists and lawmakers sound off on their attempts to bridge the political divide on guns. In tonight's Prime Focus, we go into the Texas State Capitol and speak with a bipartisan pair that might just have a solution. And it's less about learning what made me and more about the importance of grace and forgiveness and learning how to let go of resentment for the people that might have hurt you. From Friday Night Lights and Parenthood to her real-life tabloid romances, we're joined by actress Minka Kelly as she tells us how confronting her childhood trauma helped make her into the star she is today. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including the deadly scene in the border town of Brownsville, Texas, after a car rammed into a group of migrants, the suspect behind the wheel, and the charges handed down against him. Plus, the preparations underway in states like California, Texas, and Arizona as the pandemic era Title 42 law is about to expire. The White House lays out its proposal to make sure airline passengers get compensated for those delays and cancellations. And from SNL to Stranger Things, the growing list of fan favorite TV shows now on hiatus, how the writer's strike is affecting what's on TV. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and much more for us tonight. But we do begin with more gun trauma in America and questions this time about whether white nationalism was at play. Unfortunately, an all too familiar scene, panic shoppers fleeing from an active shooter this time at a mall in Allen, Texas, in what authorities say may have been an act of domestic terror. Disturbing video captures the alleged gunman getting out of his car moments before opening fire with an assault-style rifle. Eight people were killed, including three children and five adults, plus the suspect. Now authorities are investigating what drove the attack, including clues discovered online. This was the 199th mass shooting in America in 2023, but tonight that tally has already surpassed 200. Here's ABC's chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman. Tonight, authorities are investigating that Texas mall shooting, which left eight dead and seven others wounded as possible domestic terrorism. The suspect identified as 33-year-old Mauricio Garcia. Investigators tell ABC News his social media was rife with neo-Nazi ideology, racism, and hatred towards women. The Army says Garcia was discharged after only three months of service in 2008 over mental health concerns. We got shots fired at the other off. Around 3.30 Saturday afternoon, this video showing the gunman stepping out of his car and immediately turning his AR-style rifle on shoppers at the Allen Premium Outlets north of Dallas. I see a woman running in the parking lot or trying to get to the parking lot, and she's by our window, and I see her get gunned down. Raquel Lee sheltering with about a dozen others in a bathroom closet, taking this video. Outside, the shooting relentless. You're thinking, oh God, we're going to be next. And we just start, I started praying. You actually heard the screams of the victims. I can't get them out my head. Then, around 3.36 p.m., an unnamed hero officer running towards the gunfire, calling for backup. I need everybody, I got Then, saying he'd taken down the suspect alone. Joshua Barnwell, a Navy vet, also yeah. rushing in to help. I approached the woman who was conscious. She said, please work on my daughter. This woman had massive trauma, five to six gunshot wounds. I went to her daughter. I immediately started chest compressions. I knew she was gone. Stephen Spanauer, also a vet, had raced there to check on his son, who worked at the mall. And among the dead, he found a little boy alive. And what was the state of this little boy? You said he was about four years old. Yeah, he's four or five, and he was underneath some of the adults. They fell on top of him. He managed to get out, and he was covered in blood. So I got him to a safe spot so I could get him out first. The carnage unimaginable. There was a young police officer that was standing by me and he looked visibly sick and he threw up. Police evacuating hundreds, including shopper Raquel Lee. Come on out, come on out. Is anybody injured? No. Walking out with their hands up. 
eight people losing their lives, among them sisters Sofia and Daniela Mendoza, second and fourth graders at Cox Elementary School. Their principal saying they were rays of sunshine. Their mother, Ilda, still in the hospital in critical condition. Also killed Ashwarya Tatikonda, reports our affiliate WFAA. She was an engineer. And Christian LaCour, his sister Brianna telling ABC News he will always be remembered as being a really sweet kid. Such touching tributes. Let's get right to Matt Gutman. Matt, I know that investigators have been searching the suspect's car, his home, reviewing his social media posts. What are you learning tonight? In his car, Lindsay, they found handguns, long guns, and ammunition, according to a warrant obtained by our affiliate WFAA. And obviously, investigators are still digging into the suspect's background, a trove of which has been found on his social media, including images of him with uh, Nazi-style tattoos, pictures of his weapons. But there was one detail we found particularly chilling, that the suspect on multiple occasions over the past year may have scouted out this mall, even taking a screen grab of peak hours here, Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., exactly when the shooting happened, Lindsay. Wow, really just chilling, as you said there. Mac Upman, our thanks to you. And joining us now for more is Javed Ali, former counterterrorism official, now a professor at the University of Michigan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we have word investigators are looking into whether white nationalism was at play in the Allen, Texas shooting. If that ends up being the case, it's just one in a series of attacks that we've seen with this white supremacist ideology involved. Is there a white supremacy and lone wolf issue in this country? Lindsay, thanks for having me. And absolutely, there are there is a white supremacy neo-Nazi phenomena. It's been active in this country in ebbs and flows for um, for decades. And I would argue going back to the Charleston attack in 2015 with Dylan Roof, that seemed to be the latest jumping off point for this phenomena to come to come back. And what we're, we're seeing now manifestations of it. It's almost always these lone gunmen who fly under the radar screen, even though they're demonstrating behaviors and activity that should be alerting uh, or giving signs about potentially what they may intend to do, and yet they're not caught or they're not stopped until they go out and conduct an attack. And so the, the recent attack in Allen, Texas is unfortunately only the latest in a long line over the past decade. It, back in 2021, the Biden administration outlined a joint task force between the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI to combat domestic terrorism. It's been more than two years at this point. A have you seen enough to say that that task force is working? So the Biden administration, smartly, when they came in, um, actually published a, a domestic terrorism strategy, the first ever in the country's history. And I, for one, was a, an advocate of that uh, based on my previous work in government and in the White House. So I thought that strategy laid out a really good roadmap of, of new things, different parts of our government to include FBI and DHS were going to do. And I'm sure they are trying to make progress on the different pillars in this strategy, so to speak. But at the same time, what we're seeing with these attacks, it's so difficult to stop lone offenders who, for the most part, haven't committed a crime. And Garcia apparently didn't have a criminal record. He wasn't the subject of a prior FBI investigation. Um, and it's not illegal to own multiple uh, firearms in, in this country. It's not illegal to post really vitriolic things uh, about um, you know people you don't like. Uh, and unfortunately, it's a combination of all these factors that makes it easy, relatively easy for someone like this to go out and conduct an attack. So we're going to have to even rethink uh, the strategy over the past couple of years and what more can the administration and other subsequent administrations do to, to really roll this threat back. Almost a year ago, the Buffalo Massacre left 10 people dead. That should have left behind a manifesto with white supremacy rhetoric. Here we are one year later. Would you say that enough is being done to counter this ideology that's leading to several of these massacres? Well, part of the challenge here in the United States is the fact that these lone gunmen or these lone offenders are active online and whether they're writing manifestos or posting uh, photos of, of um, their intended targets or, you know, just uh, things that they're angry about. Um, right now, the social media companies, both big and large, are shielded from any liability for that content that resides on their platforms. And there's a policy debate going that has been going on in Washington over the last couple of years. Is it time now to take that liability shield down? Um, 
under Section 230 of the 1996 Communi Communications Decency Act. I, for one, think it's time to have the debate. And if anything, that liability shield may need to come down because, again, the social media companies are the ones that potentially are going to see the signs of this activity first and then do they have a corporate responsibility or any other kind of social responsibility to flag that for law enforcement for further action or, or follow-up? So this is one of the real problems we have on our hands right now. And we need to have a debate in Congress about whether this law needs to be changed. Professor Javed Ali, we thank you so much for your insight. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Lindsay. Now to yet another deadly crime in Texas, this one in the border town of Brownsville. A suspect has been charged after plowing an SUV into a group sitting at a bus stop outside of a migrant shelter with eight people. They ended up being killed. And the outstanding question tonight, was it intentional? Victor Kendo has more. Tonight, the man police say drove into a crowd of people waiting at a bus stop in Brownsville, Texas, is facing multiple charges. George Alvarez is a Brownsville local with an extensive rap sheet. He has been formally charged and arraigned with eight counts of manslaughter, 10 counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Do you understand what your rights are, sir? Yes, sir. Authorities say 34-year-old George Alvarez ran a red light before jumping the curb and plowing into 18 people. This man telling me he watched them get hit. It was like a game balls, like bowling almost. He says that everyone was in shock and it was a very traumatic moment. Police could not confirm if the crash was intentional, but said Alvarez tried to escape afterward. Attempted to flee the scene after impact, but was held down by several individuals on scene. All of the victims were men. Nearly all of them Venezuelan migrants waiting to catch a bus to Brownsville's main bus station around 8.30 Sunday morning. That horrifying video recorded by a surveillance camera from the shelter across the street where many of the migrants who were hit had just eaten breakfast. It's just tragic. I mean, we've never had a situation like this happening, you know, here at the shelter or in the city. Brownsville, known for being welcoming to migrants. But just moments ago, our cameras caught police with guns drawn, stopping this vehicle near the shelter after a report the driver may have flashed a gun at a security guard there. Let's get right to Victor Akendo in Brownsville for us. Victor, what else have we learned about the suspect who was behind the wheel of this deadly crash? Lindsay Alvarez has an extensive record that includes driving while intoxicated. Investigators here are waiting on the latest toxicology reports to come back. Tonight, he's being held on a $3.6 million bond. Lindsay. Victor Kendo for us. Thanks so much, Victor. Title 42 is set to expire on Thursday, and it's causing tensions to mount at the border with Mexico. That pandemic-era rule allowed U.S. officials to quickly send migrants back. But when Title 42 ends, tens of thousands waiting in Mexico could flood official border crossings and apply for asylum. ABC's Matt Rivers reports. Tonight, a rush toward the southern border as thousands of migrants make a desperate push to enter the U.S. Border Patrol saying it's apprehended more than 26,000 migrants in just 72 hours, another 7,500 escaping. And it comes just three days before Title 42 is set to end. The Trump era health policy allowing authorities to quickly expel migrants based on COVID concerns without giving enough time to apply for asylum. One month walking. Here in Ciudad Juarez, Juliet and her eight-year-old son, Cristian, from Colombia, think they have a better chance of getting into the U.S. now. So she's basically looking to go to the United States to look for a better future for her son. They're joining the thousands who've already made the decision to cross to El Paso before new asylum rules take effect on Friday. This is the U.S.-Mexico border, and migrants have been crossing at this spot nonstop. But with Title 42 ending later this week, the question is, how many more people will be crossing by the end of this week? Officials are bracing for upwards of 10,000 migrant crossings every day. Our Mireya Villarreal is seeing the migrants on the U.S. side in El Paso. Right behind me, you see hundreds of migrants waiting. Some people have told us they've been here for eight days trying to get across the border and then into some sort of shelter here in the U.S. In preparation, the Biden administration is expanding holding facilities, adding immigration officers, and even sending 1,500 active duty troops to support the response. 
But some officials from border states, like Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema, warn that's nowhere near enough. Those are aspirational. Mm -hmm. That's not the same as operational. Rent the buses, hire the drivers, build the soft-sided facilities so that we can process individuals. And tonight, Texas deploying more than 500 additional National Guard troops along the border as the state prepares for what might come next. Matt joins us now from Mexico tonight. Matt, even though a surge is expected when Title 42 expires, could it become even more difficult for migrants to apply for asylum? In some ways, yes, Lindsay, I and mean, a lot of the people who are there behind me have chosen to cross the border now because starting Friday, there will be a series of new rules put in place. Anyone who's applying for asylum here at the United States border needs to follow those rules. And if those new rules, they're complicated, are not followed, then these migrants run the risk uh, of not being allowed to reenter the United States for at least five years in addition, Lindsay, to being deported back to their home countries. And Matt, if I can, just set the scene for us behind you. What are we seeing? there. People are waiting at this point for what? Well, they're waiting to try and get processed by U.S. immigration officials. So we're on the Mexico side. When migrants come here, they cross the river behind me. The, the Rio Grande is right there below me. They go up to the other side, and then they wait. And they can't go any further past the U.S. border wall there until U.S. immigration officials allow them to get in, allow them to be processed. What happens then, whether they get deported, whether they get released into the United States, that's a separate question. But right now, these people are stuck there just waiting to be processed by immigration officials with no real expected date or time when they're going to be processed, Lindsay. Wow. All right. Matt Rivers for us. Thanks so much, Matt. A grand jury is about to weigh in on a deadly confrontation on a New York City subway when a former Marine used a chokehold on a man who witnesses said was acting erratically and threatening passengers. That man died from his injuries. The case has sparked an intense debate over public safety and mental health. Protesters disrupted subway service over the weekend, saying that Marine went too far. Our Stephanie Ramos has the latest. Tonight, attorneys for the family of the man who died after being restrained in a chokehold on a Manhattan subway furious, calling for second-degree murder charges against the former Marine. A situation into their own hands and causes a fatality. It comes after Marine veteran Daniel Penny broke his silence four days after he was seen in this video restraining Neely in a chokehold for at least three minutes. Penny threw attorneys expressing condolences, but saying Neely was aggressively threatening passengers and that Penny and other riders acted to protect themselves, adding Penny never intended to harm Mr. Neely. Attorneys for Neely's family say he was homeless and had battled mental health issues since his mother's murder in 2007. No justice! Help me. This weekend, demonstrations erupting on the streets and subway platforms. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, is the Manhattan Grand Jury expected to take this case? They are. Sources say, Lindsay, that the Manhattan Grand Jury is likely to take this case this week. We're also hearing that here in New York City, more protests are expected. Lindsay. All right. Stephanie Ramos. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Now to the sexual assault and defamation case against former President Trump, which is now set to go to the jury tomorrow. The former president did not appear in court, but in closing arguments today, lawyers for his accuser used Trump's own words on video in their case against him. Meanwhile, Trump's lawyer called the claims a, quote, incredible work of fiction. Here's ABC's senior investigative reporter, Aaron Katursky. In their final message to the jury, lawyers for E. Jean Carroll used Donald Trump's own words against him, taking on his claim he did not rape Carroll because she was not his type. They played the moment in Trump's deposition when he's handed this photograph and mistakes Carroll for his ex-wife, Marla Maples. It's Marla. You say Marla's in this photo? That's Marla, yeah. That's, that's my wife. Which woman are you pointing to? No. Here. Carol. Oh, that, the person oh, okay. you just pointed to was oh, Eugene Carroll. Carroll's attorney, Roberta Kaplan, said that proves Carroll was exactly Trump's type. Carroll's team also played the jury the infamous Access Hollywood tape, calling it a confession. Trump telling you in his own words how he treats women. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just kiss. I don't even know what. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. They played Trump's explanation. Well, historically, that's true with stars. It's true with stars that, that they can grab women by the Well, that's what, it's, if you look over the last million years, I guess that's been largely true. Not always, but largely true. 
unfortunately or fortunately. Carol's attorney pounced. Who would say fortunately to describe the act of sexual assault? I know who, Kaplan said. He thinks stars like him can get away with it. The defense called Carol's story an unbelievable work of fiction, ripped from a 2012 episode of Law & Order SVU, in which a woman gets raped at the same department store. What's the likelihood of that, Trump's attorney Joe Tacopina said? One in 20 billion? Tacopina told the jury what Carol wants is for you to hate Trump enough to ignore the facts. Aaron Katursky joins us now. Aaron, with closing arguments now over, what can we expect next in this case? Starting Tuesday morning, the judge is going to read his charge to the jury, instruct them on the law, and then they'll start to deliberate. There are six men, three women, and they will weigh everything said in closing arguments and decide if former President Trump is liable for raping E. Jean Carroll or some kind of lesser sexual offense. And if they do find that, then Trump could be forced to pay Carroll monetary damages. Lindsay? Aaron Katursky. Thanks so much, Aaron. Turning now to the recordings revealing then-Congressman Ron DeSantis grappling with how to appeal to former President Trump's base during his bid for governor in 2018. ABC News obtained almost two and a half hours of raw internal tapes of DeSantis during debate prep sessions that have never been made public. In one moment, Representative Matt Gates questions DeSantis on if there are any issues that he's disagreed with Trump. Take a listen. Is there any issue upon which you disagree with President Trump? <laughs> figure out how to do this. Obviously there is because I've, I mean, I've voted contrary to him in the Congress. I mean, it's just I have to frame it in a way that's not going to piss off all his voters. And so what I do is I do what I think is right. I support um, his agenda in terms of what he's been able to do. If I have a disagreement, I talk to him in private. The comments by the former representative provide a rare look at how then-candidate for Florida governor went about trying to appeal to Trump's base without alienating them, something he may need to do again as he pursues a planned run for the White House against Trump in 2024. A representative for DeSantis declined to comment when contacted by ABC News. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. The sexual harassment accusations against Tiger Woods from his ex-girlfriend and the mega lawsuit she's filed. But first, in the pursuit of change, as Texas becomes the site of a tragedy yet again, in tonight's Prime Focus, we meet a bipartisan pair who believe that they might have the answer to curbing gun violence as families grapple with the pain of losing loved ones again. I just remember getting the call from his best friend telling me that, um, Mama Stone, you need to get to the school because they said Chris got shot. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The 
those are just some of the chants and pleas for more than 160 activists calling for the Texas state legislature to take action on gun laws. Some of those faces, the family members of the children of Uvalde, whose lives were cut short last May at the Robb Elementary mass shooting. The one year mark of that Uvalde massacre is now just days away and still as the nation saw just this past weekend, mass shootings remain all too common in this country. America has more than 390 million weapons in circulation, according to a 2018 survey. That's more guns than people in this country. And when it comes to the recent spate of mass shootings in Texas, mental health is what Governor Greg Abbott claims is at the center of the issue. But there are those within his state's legislature who are arguing for more to be done, and they can be found on both sides of the aisle. In our prime focus tonight, we're in Texas with activists pushing for solutions, family members still reeling from losing loved ones, and Republican and Democratic lawmakers who are hoping that their partnership could usher in some change. ABC's Maria Villarreal has the story. Eight people killed after a shooter armed with an AR-15 style rifle opens fire in an outdoor mall north of Dallas. Another massacre in Texas adding to the growing list of mass shootings across the country. Comes down inside the school, shooter is down as now as well. Let's go! Including a school shooting in Nashville, Tennessee. Another in a bank in Louisville, Kentucky. And five people killed in a home in Cleveland, Texas. Already nearly 200 of them so far this year. The gun violence archive defining a mass shooting as four or more victims shot or killed. Grieving families across the country have become activists. With the goal of pushing lawmakers to take action on gun reform. They're gunless. They're not here. I'm talking about gun violence. And those same lawmakers sometimes push to the brink. Frustration and emotion boiling over across party lines. This was the route that he yes. took that day. Mm -hmm. He came down this hallway, he took a right, um, didn't go into the first room, and walked into the second room, and that's where he started. On the other side of these doors, 17 year old Chris Stone took his last breath. A fellow student opening fire at Santa Fe High School just outside Houston in May 2018. I just remember getting the call from his best friend telling me that, um, Mama Stone, you need to get to the school because they said Chris got shot. Tell me what you know of that day with him. He saved seven kids that day in the art room. They tried to break down the back door and they were unsuccessful. He held the door shut and from my understanding, they struggled at the door a little bit. Chris wouldn't let them in, and so that's when the killer took a step back and shot him through the door. Five years later, sitting just steps away from where the shooting began, Chris's mother and other families worry that despite shooting after shooting, no real change will happen in a pro-gun state like Texas. I'm a conservative Republican, yes. Conservative Republican. It kind of surprises me that you would say something like, we need to have a conversation about guns and about gun legislation, reform. Right. Yes. Any change is better than nothing. I may not agree with everything, what everybody's fighting for, but any kind of change is better than nothing. And if that's what they believe in, I support them. The school in Santa Fe reopened. The once red tiles reminding students of blood have been painted green and security has been tightened. But Yana Stone says that's where the changes stopped, and it's simply not enough. They care more about guns than children. They care more about money than our future. State Senator Roland Gutierrez, a Democrat who represents Uvalde, introducing a slew of gun legislation bills after the shooting there including raising the minimum age to purchase a semi-automatic rifle from 18 to 21, extreme risk protective orders, and expanding safe storage requirements. He says he knows full well that most of his proposals don't stand a chance. We're never going to legislate this thing away, but we have to make it harder. And in Texas, we've not done anything to make it harder. 
Republicans have done absolutely nothing to make it harder. New nationwide polling shows 58% of those polled support stricter gun laws in the U.S., 93% support background checks for all gun buyers, and 73% support raising the minimum age to buy any gun to 21 years old. Some families have pointed to other conservative states like Florida as an example of swift action across party lines. Just 21 days after a shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida in 2018, then Republican Governor Rick Scott signed into law a comprehensive bipartisan bill that included red flag warning laws and raising the minimum age to buy a gun from 18 to 21. So many have asked if a state like Florida could do it back then, why not Texas now? This legislative session, over 100 bills were introduced on gun reform in Texas. No more than two have made it out of committee. Some people will say having a Republican and a Democrat in one room just doesn't happen all that often. It happens in Texas. <laughs> uh, you know, Representative Moody and I are, you know, obviously have worked on many of things together and consider him a friend and a good person. Republican State Representative Dustin Burroughs and Democratic State Representative Joe Moody sat on a special legislative committee that came together in the wake of the Uvalde mass shooting and are now working together on community safety. I certainly couldn't have asked for a better partner in doing the work. It was incredibly important work. Burroughs and Moody co-authored a bill that got support from dozens of their colleagues in both parties as well as from Texas Governor Greg Abbott. But the bill focused on school safety. It wasn't about gun reform. Can we see what happened in Florida potentially happen here? Could we see a change in the age of being able to purchase these styles of weapon? I do think there's probably a constitutional impediment from denying 21, you know, eight, the same rights as somebody over the age of 21. It's important those families have that conversation about raising the age because it, it absolutely implicates what happened. Uh, in Uvalde. And his property was Texas resident Christina Delgado feels so strongly about gun reform, she left her day job to fight for families who have lost loved ones. Why are we not seeing what parents, families, communities are asking for then being translated in Austin at the legislature? Why are politicians delaying this? It's just the political game. This is not a political issue. This is not a partisan issue. This is a human issue. This is a public health issue. During this legislative session, Delgado is in Austin working with the Community Justice Action Fund, now helping Uvalde families navigate the political process to affect change. When people say that's never going to happen, though, in Texas, we're going to keep our guns, we're going to hold true to our rights, how do you respond to that? We can all keep our guns. and. The majority of us here in Texas are gun owners and gun owning families. But there are responsibilities that we all have, not just as parents, not just as Texans, but as Americans, and more importantly, as gun owners, to really stand by those responsibilities. After losing their daughter, 10 year old Tess Mata, in the Robb Elementary School shooting last year, Veronica and Jerry Mata are demanding something be done from legislators. They, along with several other families in Uvalde, have joined the fight to change Texas, somehow finding time to visit Austin nearly every week, meeting with any lawmaker who is willing to hear them out. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. I get up. It's already hard enough to get up to go to work every single day. And then when you, I'm at school and I'm in my classroom and then you hear that there's another shooting. And I sit there and I look at my kids in my classroom and I wonder, is that gonna be us next time? So many are haunted by that same question. Our thanks to Maria Villarreal for that. Just a few hours ago, those two lawmakers in the piece were successful after their committee managed to pass a bill to raise the age to purchase an AR-15 from 18 to 21. That bill still needs to be voted on by the full house. We still have much more to get to on Pride tonight. Questions and controversy surrounding the world's most famous horse race. What led to the death of seven horses ahead of the Kentucky Derby? But next, she's known for her role in the iconic show Friday Night Lights and now actress Ming 
Minka Kelly is reclaiming her own narrative, the painful yet honest revelations in her new book, Tell Me Everything. Um, there's, there's more than meets the eye to all women. And um, I'm excited to be someone to finally tell the story on my terms and say that there's, there's more than, than just associating me with people you've seen in the tablets. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Brooke Shields, the most photographed woman in the world. A sexualized child model. Exploitation. What happened to her isn't really about hers. It's just about women. I let myself be vulnerable. And this is the first time I've ever spoken about what happened. I thought my one no should have been enough. You know. When someone like Brooke Shields talks about it, it makes a difference. I'm amazed that I survived any of it. It's so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, people, admit it. You love your game shows. I love game shows. We all love game shows. It's showtime. But what don't you know? Just when you thought you knew everything about game shows. A show about game shows. So special. My guilty pleasure. Anything goes. Making whoopee. Oh, it's better than sex. Well, now, Jerry, I'm not sure about all that. Just but it is going to be good. Welcome to the game show. show. Premiering Wednesday night on ABC. You're welcome. And they stream it on Hulu. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. If your town's main street is feeling a bit crowded or perhaps your city street's a little more empty, you're not imagining things. Recent census figures reveal which cities are growing and which ones are shrinking. Here's a rundown of the details by the numbers. As the pandemic eases, the shift to the Sun Belt goes on. The Phoenix area gained nearly 57,000 new residents in 2022, making Maricopa the fastest growing county in the U.S. for the second year in a row. Houston and Dallas areas each gained about 45,000 residents, putting those Texas cities at 
second and third place, respectively. A 7.5% population increase made the Villages, a sprawling retirement community in Central Florida, the location with the highest rate of growth. In fact, three of the top 10 growing counties are in Florida. The latest data does show the exodus from big cities may be slowing. Overall, large metro areas lost about 800,000 people to other parts of the country last year. But that's an improvement from a 1.2 million drop the year before. And after experiencing a 7% population decline during the pandemic, San Francisco slowed its losses with about 3,000 people moving away. Meanwhile, New York City dropped 123,000 people. That's half the population loss it suffered the previous year, while Manhattan actually bucked the trend and gained 17,000 new residents. The news wasn't as good for some other cities. Los Angeles, for example, lost more than 90,000 people, and Chicago saw about 68,000 move away. Experts say it'll take a few more years for the effects of the pandemic to fully shake out, but the impact of the population shift is sure to be something that we'll be talking about for some time to come. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime. Exploring the mental health in the Asian American community, how the hit show Beef is opening up a new conversation and helping to break an old stigma on mental health. And forcing airlines to pay up to scorned customers, the proposal from the Biden administration that will require compensation for passengers whose flights are canceled or delayed. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Okay, people, admit it. You love your game shows. I love game shows. We all love game shows. It's showtime. But what don't you know? Just when you thought you knew everything about game shows? A show about game shows. So special. My guilty pleasure. Anything goes. Making whoopee. <sighs> it's better than sex. Well, now, Jerry, I'm not sure about all that, Just but it is going to be good. Welcome to the game show. show. Premiering Wednesday night on ABC. You're welcome. And then stream it on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. 13 women opened their doors to the man who would end their lives. Truth and Lies, The Boston Strangler, the new true crime podcast series. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts and watch Boston Strangler starring Kira Knightley, streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live.
my favorite show. Seven horses die in the run-up to the Kentucky Derby. Tiger Woods accused of sexual harassment. And the writer's strike hits Stranger Things. These stories and more in tonight's Rundown. Officials at Kentucky Derby's home, Churchill Downs, investigating the deaths of seven horses over the past few weeks. Two horses died on race day Saturday. Churchill Downs reporting there were no discernible patterns to the injuries those horses sustained. The organization also called the sudden deaths of two horses, parents' pride in chasing Artie, highly unusual. Mage won the 149th Derby, which saw five horses pulled from the field before the race. Officials in Cleveland searching for an EMS worker who was supposed to attend a rape trial hearing. They say they haven't seen 30-year-old Michelle Jordan since Saturday night. Police say she is in danger. Jordan had told WEWS she was planning to attend a pretrial hearing for Michael Stenot on felony rape charges that was scheduled for today. WEWS also says Jordan was willing to testify in the trial and that her sister had said Jordan was being harassed. The White House working on ways to compensate air travelers when airlines cancel or postpone their trips. President Biden and Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg announced new initiatives, including boosted compensation for meals and hotels. Passengers are stranded for reasons within an airline's control. I know how frustrated many of you are with the service you get from your U.S. airlines. That's why our top priority has been to get American air travelers a better deal. The administration also announced an expanded website with a dashboard explaining which airlines offer cash or other compensation. Tiger Woods facing another court battle, this time from a former girlfriend filing a new $30 million lawsuit accusing him of sexual harassment. An attorney for Erica Herman, who dated Woods for nearly six years, writes in a new court filing, Woods decided to pursue a sexual relationship with his employee. Then, according to him, forced her to sign an NDA about it or else be fired from her job. Woods' attorney responding to a previous filing saying Herman is a jilted ex-girlfriend who wants to publicly litigate specious claims in court. The WGA writer's strike already impacting movies and television just about one week in. Last night's MTV Movie and TV Awards, normally a live event with a host and red carpet, essentially became a clip show with pre-taped speeches and segments. Meanwhile, production is on hold for shows that include the final season of Stranger Things. That show's creators, the Duffer Brothers, said they hoped a fair deal would be reached so they could go back to work on the show. Meanwhile, the Marvel film Blade reportedly is the first film to be delayed because of the strike. It's the end of an era for the band behind hits that include Fat Lip and In Too Deep. Some 41 says its upcoming ninth album and the subsequent world tour would be the end for the band. Group saying they were looking forward to seeing fans at upcoming shows and excited for what the future held for each of them. It'll mark the end of 27 years for the band with frontman Derek Wibley, the only remaining original member. The group said it would finish its current tour dates for the year before the release of the album and final worldwide tour. tonight a closer look at mental health and the ethnic group in America that is least likely to seek help. Many Asian Americans say that shame and stigma hold them back, but there's also a growing movement to change that reality. Here's ABC's Arena Roy. The dark comedy beef is a global sensation. The story is centered on an ever escalating feud between stars Stephen Yun and Ali Wong. I would love to let this go. Uh, Actions have consequences. But critics are also praising the Netflix hit series for exploring mental health in the Asian American community. You know who you should talk to? Ah, Western therapy doesn't work on Easter minds. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, Asian Americans are the least likely racial or ethnic group to seek mental health treatment. Mental health issues are often considered a taboo topic. So this can cause individuals to either downplay or disregard their symptoms. For Dimple Patel, that cultural stigma was ingrained in her as a young girl. If something happened, it's like, you're fine, and move on. But in 2008, she was in a car accident, leading to anxiety and panic attacks. Eventually, she began seeing a therapist in secret through her university's counseling department. 
Why did you keep it a secret from your family? I was worried about what their reaction was going to be, especially with mental health not being talked about in my family, let alone the Asian culture. There's a lot of shame and stigma that something's wrong with you. The life-changing experience inspiring her career path, Patel earning a doctorate in clinical psychology. But amid her shifting mindset, her mother was suffering in silence, dying by suicide in 2011. The initial shock for my family was, the, what are people going to say? Do you think therapy might have helped create potentially a different outcome? I think so. And I think that if we had more awareness about what the signs and symptoms of depression were, that we could have intervened earlier. Stigma, language barriers, lack of health coverage, shortage of culturally aware practitioners all contribute to the treatment gap along with the so-called model minority myth, which stereotypes all Asian Americans as effortlessly successful. Some of these myths are internalized, and so that perpetuates or reinforces the idea of needing to push through and needing to be strong. Now, as a therapist herself, Patel is working to end the stigma. I don't blame my parents for not knowing what to do. They knew what their parents told them. What I realized was that I could make that change and break that cycle. Our thanks to Rena for that. Colorful and chaotic. That's how actress Minka Kelly describes her childhood, one that was full of struggle as she watched her mom battle addiction, experience domestic violence, an attempt to make ends meet all before dying of cancer in 2008. Now Kelly is putting her pain on paper, bearing it all in her memoir, Tell Me Everything. She sat down with our Trevor Alt to talk about honesty and healing. Actress, model, philanthropist, Minka Kelly has been in the public spotlight for years, beginning with her role as cheerleader Lila Garrity in the iconic show Friday Night Lights. A little late, aren't you? Yeah, sorry. Name? Lila Garrity. But there is so much more to Kelly, and now the star is telling her own story, sharing the difficult details of her childhood and her path to fame. I know that you've talked about in this book and some of your interviews how for a long time you wanted to avoid talking about your personal life. Mm -hmm. Now you're really talking about your personal life. Yeah. You still stand by that? You don't regret that at this point with all these interviews? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I have had moments where I'm, I've asked myself, what am I doing? Why did I do this? It's not natural for me to, you know, want to be this vulnerable and share this much of myself, but I've gotten to a point where I just feel like I'm on the other side of a lot of really painful and shameful experiences and mindsets that I feel like it's not mine anymore. It's, it's um, my responsibility now to share. You talk in great depth about your childhood about your relationship with your mother and her struggles with addiction, mm -hmm. at times that you're living in, in storage lockers. But also, your story is not just listen to the childhood that I had and how hard it was. I mean, what are the takeaways that you want people to have from your book beyond just learning what made you? It's less about learning what made me and more about the importance of grace and forgiveness and learning how to let go of resentment for the people that might have hurt you because people don't move about the world intending to hurt people they love. There's a reason why times get hard and I have been through a really long and deep healing journey and I also feel like my mother's story deserves to be told because she's not the only single mother who struggled with addiction and had to make ends meet on her own and did what she had to do to survive. And you do really make a point in talking about your mother. I mean, a lot of people, I feel like, if they were speaking their mother, their mother struggled with addiction and working as a stripper, like, you're very clear your mother's not a villain. In Thank the story. you. That, I really appreciate you saying that. It was, I worked really hard to make sure, because on the surface, a lot of people would mistake her for being a villain and villainize her and say that she was a bad mom. I had a therapist tell me she was a bad mom. So really? I really appreciate you knowing that and understanding that it's so much more complex than just saying someone was right. bad. I'm curious, as somebody who has been, I mean, your personal life, while I know you largely tried to avoid talking about it. A lot of it played out in tabloids mm -hmm. over years and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Knowing where you're at now in uh, maybe your own sense of peace or your own mm -hmm. personal boundaries, mm -hmm. what would you want a younger Minka to know about wading through all those waters? Mm. I am excited to write my own narrative now. 
Yeah. I would tell that previous Minka that, that it's okay that one day you'll tell your story on your terms when you're ready. I look forward to us getting to a place where we don't reduce women based on who the world might think that they're associating them with by what you see on TV or on the internet. I'm excited that we're getting to a place where we want to know more about people and, and see what's beneath the surface. Um, there's, there's more than meets the eye to all women. And um, I'm excited to be someone to finally tell the story on my terms and say that there's, there's more than, than just associating me with people you've seen in the tabloids. Given your childhood that you talk about extensively in the book, what were the lessons, for better or for worse, that you think you learned from that upbringing as a young adult and also as the years played out and as you continue to grow? I learned a lot what not to do in my childhood and that was all conscious choices and lessons but then when you get into the subconscious you know you grow up and you tell yourself I'm not gonna repeat what I grew up in I'm not gonna repeat her mistakes I'm gonna make different choices I'm gonna live a different kind of life and you do that but then there you find yourself stuck in certain maybe dysfunctional patterns and you're like, why does this keep happening? And then you do a lot of therapy and you find a life coach and you do everything you can to understand all these things about you and you find out, oh my God, my subconscious has been controlling a lot of the way I was perceiving the world and operating in my relationships and recreating the chaos in your life you grew up in because it's what's familiar to you. And you go to what's familiar even if it hurts. But I had to unlearn that as an adult. I had to learn that now I'm a grown up and I'm in charge and I'm safe. And I don't need to outsource my safety or my value to anyone. Have you been hearing from women since you wrote this? It's making being at parties more fun because <laughs> we don't have to small talk. I am so excited now that I get to have real conversations and women come up to me and tell me about their complicated relationships with their mothers. I've talked three women into maybe extending an olive branch where they were refusing to beforehand and and that's that makes me emotional thinking about it right now because I would have loved to someone uh, encourage me to do that a little bit sooner than I did yeah. um, so uh, that's why this is very important to me of this course. is for my mom my mom's just story deserves to be told you know you deserve a lot of credit because this is a very vulnerable position to put yourself in writing a, a book about your upbringing at any point when you were pretty far along the line were you like I don't know if I want to do this or a huge section of the book maybe that one's not um, for it. There's so many things in this book that I wrote it all I got it all out and then I would want to go back and be like okay maybe this doesn't need to be in there but it's actually those moments that are the most important and now sharing those moments they don't have any power over me anymore. It sounds like you almost feel free now. I feel free of shame yeah yeah I do and it's a it's a relief. Our thanks to Trevor Alt for that. And you can buy Minka Kelly's Tell Me Everything book wherever books are sold. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Up in the next hour on the road to recovery where jamie fox stands after a medical emergency put him in the hospital for weeks and an important visit for an american detained in russia what we know about the meeting between the u.s ambassador to russia and paul whelan This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there.
This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Okay, people, admit it. You love your game shows. I love game shows. We all love game shows. It's showtime. But what don't you know? Just when you thought you knew everything about game shows? A show about game shows. So special. My guilty pleasure. Anything goes. Making whoopee. Oh, it's better than sex. Well, now, Jerry, I'm not sure about all that. Just but it is going to be good. Welcome to the game show. show. Premiering Wednesday night on ABC. You're welcome. And they stream it on Hulu. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot to get to tonight, including the aftermath of that deadly shooting in Allen, Texas. Why investigators are now probing the suspect's past for potential white supremacy leanings. Plus, the deadly scene in the border town of Brownsville after a car rammed into a group of migrants, the suspect behind the wheel, and the charges handed down against him. The catastrophic flooding hitting the Congo. The thousands now left homeless with more rain on the way. And the very real threat of AI, our exclusive one-on-one -on -one with Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates, as we look into a tech future that's causing concern. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and much more for us tonight. But we do begin with more gun trauma in America and questions this time about whether white nationalism was at play. A shockingly familiar scene, panic shoppers fleeing from an active shooter at a mall in Allen, Texas, and what authorities say may have been an act of domestic terror. Disturbing video captures the alleged gunman getting out of his car before opening fire with an assault-style rifle. Eight people were killed, including three children, five adults, plus the suspect. Now authorities are investigating what drove the attack, including clues discovered online. It was the 199th mass shooting in America in 2023, but tonight that tally has already surpassed 200. Here's ABC's chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman. Tonight, authorities are investigating that Texas mall shooting, which left eight dead and seven others wounded as possible domestic terrorism. The suspect identified as 33-year-old Mauricio Garcia. Investigators tell ABC News his social media was rife with neo-Nazi ideology, racism, and hatred towards women. The Army says Garcia was discharged after only three months of service in 2008 over mental health concerns. We got shots fired at the young wall. Around 3.30 Saturday afternoon, this video showing the gunman stepping out of his car and immediately turning his AR-style rifle on shoppers at the Allen Premium Outlets north of Dallas. I see a woman running in the parking lot or trying to get to the parking lot, and she's by our window, and I see her get gunned down. Raquel Lee sheltering with about a dozen others in a bathroom closet, taking this video. Outside, the shooting relentless. You're thinking, oh, God, we're going to be next. And we just start, I started praying. You actually heard the screams of the victims. Mm -hmm. I can't get them out my head. Then, around 3.36 p.m., an unnamed hero officer running towards the gunfire, calling for backup. I everybody I got. Then, saying he'd taken down the suspect alone. 
Joshua Barnwell, a Navy vet, also rushing in to help. I approached the woman who was conscious. She said, please work on my daughter. This woman had massive trauma, five to six gunshot wounds. I went to her daughter. I immediately started chest compressions. I knew she was gone. Stephen Spanauer, also a vet, had raced there to check on his son, who worked at the mall. And among the dead, he found a little boy alive. And what was the state of this little boy? You said he was about four years old. Yeah, he was four or five, and he was underneath some of the adults. They fell on top of him. He managed to get out, and he was covered in blood. So I got him to a safe spot so I could get him out first. The carnage unimaginable. There was a young police officer that was standing by me and he looked visibly sick and he threw up. Police evacuating hundreds, including shopper Raquel Lee. Come on out, come on out. Is anybody injured? No. Walking out with their hands up. Eight people losing their lives, among them sisters Sofia and Daniela Mendoza, second and fourth graders at Cox Elementary School. Their principal saying they were rays of sunshine. Their mother, Ilda, still in the hospital in critical condition. Also killed Ashwarya Tatikonda, reports our affiliate WFAA. She was an engineer. And Christian LaCour, his sister Brianna telling ABC News he will always be remembered as being a really sweet kid. Authorities are telling us that right now, Lindsay, the motive is still undetermined, but they're digging intensely into the suspect's background. They tell us that in 2008, he was discharged from the Army over mental health concerns. They're also pouring over his social media history, finding hundreds of racially motivated posts. And on his body, after he was killed in that building just behind me, they say they found a patch with white supremacist insignia. Lindsay. Matt, thank you. Now to another deadly incident, also in Texas, this one in the border town of Brownsville. A suspect has been charged after plowing an SUV into a group gathered at a bus stop outside of a migrant shelter. Eight people were killed, and now authorities are trying to determine whether the act of violence was intentional. Let's get right to ABC's Victor Akendo. Tonight, the man police say drove into a crowd of people waiting at a bus stop in Brownsville, Texas, is facing multiple charges. George Alvarez is a Brownsville local with an extensive rap sheet. He has been formally charged and arraigned with eight counts of manslaughter, 10 counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Do you understand what you're right, sir? Yes, sir. Authorities say 34-year-old George Alvarez ran a red light before jumping the curb and plowing into 18 people. This man telling me he watched them get hit. It was like a game with balls, like bowling almost. La reacción de eso es traumante. Todo el mundo entró en shock. He says that everyone was in shock and it was a very traumatic moment. Todo, todo. Nadie, todo el mundo quedó en shock. Police could not confirm if the crash was intentional, but said Alvarez tried to escape afterward. Attempted to flee the scene after impact, but was held down by several individuals on scene. All of the victims were men, nearly all of them Venezuelan migrants, waiting to catch a bus to Brownsville's main bus station around 8.30 Sunday morning. That horrifying video, recorded by a surveillance camera from the shelter across the street, where many of the migrants who were hit had just eaten breakfast. It's just tragic. I mean, we've never had a situation like this happening, you know, here at the shelter or in the city. Brownsville, known for being welcoming to migrants. But just moments ago, our cameras caught police with guns drawn, stopping this vehicle near the shelter after a report the driver may have flashed a gun at a security guard there. Lindsay Alvarez has an extensive record that includes driving while intoxicated. Investigators here are waiting on the latest toxicology reports to come back. Tonight, he's being held on a $3.6 million bond. Lindsay. Victor, thank you. A grand jury is about to weigh in on a deadly confrontation on a New York City subway. A former Marine used a chokehold on a man who witnesses said was acting erratically and threatening passengers. That man died from his injuries. The case sparked an intense debate over public safety and mental health. Protesters disrupted subway service over the weekend, saying that Marine went too far. Our Stephanie Ramos has the latest. Tonight, attorneys for the family of the man who died after being restrained in a chokehold on a Manhattan subway furious, calling for second-degree murder charges against the former Marine. It needs to be made clear that there are consequences when a civilian takes a situation into their own hands and causes a fatality 
It comes after Marine veteran Daniel Penny broke his silence four days after he was seen in this video restraining Neely in a chokehold for at least three minutes. Penny, through attorneys, expressing condolences, but saying Neely was aggressively threatening passengers and that Penny and other riders acted to protect themselves, adding Penny never intended to harm Mr. Neely. Attorneys for Neely's family say he was homeless and had battled mental health issues since his mother's murder in 2007. No justice! Help me! This weekend, demonstrations erupting on the streets and subway platforms. Sources say, Lindsay, that the Manhattan Grand Jury is likely to take this case this week. We're also hearing that here in New York City, more protests are expected. Lindsay. Stephanie, thank you. Now to the latest on actor Jamie Foxx, who's been recovering for weeks in the hospital after a medical emergency. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has some positive news as he starts his road to recovery. People close to actor Jamie Foxx giving an update on his mysterious hospitalization. A source telling People magazine they were told the Ray star. I might be blind, but I ain't stupid who is recovering in a hospital from an undisclosed medical emergency last month, is stable and not in a life-threatening situation now. That person also saying doctors are doing more tests and want to be completely sure that he will be okay before allowing him to be discharged and that the Oscar winner has been advised to keep his stress level down once he leaves the hospital. Sources do tell people that they want to make sure that he is perfectly stable when they do eventually release him, but unfortunately we still don't know exactly when that will be. This update coming just days after this message was posted on Fox's Instagram account saying, appreciate all the love, feeling blessed. Before being hospitalized, the 55-year-old was most recently seen filming in Atlanta with co-star Cameron Diaz on the set of Netflix upcoming film, Back in Action. The Fox Insider telling people what happened to him medically is serious enough to keep him in the hospital, but adding the hospital is the last place Jamie wants to be, saying he has a lot of projects going on. He gets things done. He is focused and astute. We've heard from some friends in his inner circle that he is recovering well, and they all do uh, hope for the best, and they do think that he will come out of this uh, sooner rather than later. We're all pulling for him. Our thanks to Eva for that. Now to the effort to get Americans wrongfully imprisoned in Russia back home. Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich remains jailed on accusations of spying after his appeal was denied last month. And so does former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan, who has been detained since 2018 after he was convicted and sentenced to 16 years on espionage charges, which the U.S. disputes. We're joined once again by Paul's brother, David Whelan. David, thanks so much for joining us once again. Uh, just last week, the U.S. ambassador to Russia, Lynn Tracy, was able to meet with your brother at the prison in camp where he's being held. Tell us what you've learned from that meeting. It sounds like they were able to speak for about 90 minutes, and uh, I think it was a, a frank discussion. Uh, Paul is very appreciative every time a U.S. ambassador comes out to the prison or even consular staff, but this is the uh, second time that a uh, U.S. ambassador has come out to visit him, and uh, he values that, and he understands the, the risk that uh, the ambassador took to come and see him uh, and appreciated that uh, she came to give him a personal message about uh, the efforts that are going on back here in uh, Washington, D.C. And was she able to report back to you as far as his health, his overall well-being, state of mind? We heard from Paul. He was able to speak to our parents. And uh, it sounds like he's stabilized since uh, Mr. Gershkovich's arrest. Uh, I think he is back to uh, focusing on getting through each day, surviving as best he can, and, uh, and hoping, hoping that the uh, U.S. government will uh, be able to secure his release. Your sister also appeared last month at the United Nations Security Council to call for Paul's release. She got to look Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov directly in the eye. How significant was that moment? I think that was really important. Uh, Elizabeth has done a lot of lobbying of the government, I think, uh, even from just trying to get the State Department's attention four years ago to be able to now uh, have gotten to the UN Security Council and to uh, have been able to make an address there. Uh, it, it's really valuable. And I think Paul appreciated that really we are not leaving any stone unturned uh, to try and uh, advocate for him and bring him home. There's been talk about a possible deal to get your brother home, a swap that could also include Evan Gershkovich. Is there cause for some optimism in those negotiations? I don't think so, not at the moment. Uh, we know that uh, Secretary Blinken has spoken about an offer that was made, uh, but it has been sitting there now for four or five months, and the Kremlin doesn't seem that interested in whatever the concession is. So uh, either the U.S. government is going to continue to wait, which means that Paul has to continue to sit in a labor camp uh, for 
uh, who knows how long, or they will come up with other creative strategies. Uh, I hope that they'll come up with creative strategies, and I hope that they'll come up with something else that will bring Paul home. Uh, President Biden also mentioned Paul at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Are you seeing any meaningful shift in urgency surrounding Paul's case, or, or do you still have the same concerns about his case languishing? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it was great to see President Biden speak out. Uh, we appreciate uh, all of the uh, verbal sentiment of support from the White House, from President Biden, from uh, the Secretary of State, and so on. But uh, it doesn't mean that there's anything moving in Paul's case at this moment. And, uh, and I think we do worry that uh, it is beginning to languish. It is getting to that point where, in many other wrongful detention cases, like Mark Swyden and Kai Lee in China, uh, at Simak Namazi and Imad Sh uh, Shaghi in Iran, uh, that there comes a time at, after which the U.S. government isn't really very effective at bringing people home. We still continue to hold out hope nonetheless. David, we thank you once again for coming on the show. We'll, of course, continue to check in uh, with you and your brother's case. Thanks so much for having me. Still much more to get to. Coming up, devastating flooding tears through the Congo, the desperate search for survivors, and the rushing waters that have killed at least 400 people. Plus, an ABC News exclusive one-on-one -on -one with tech giant Bill Gates, his concerns about the growing trend of artificial intelligence. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Buckingham Palace, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Protesters in central Belgrade took to the streets following two mass shootings last week, including one at a primary school that left 17 dead and 21 wounded, many of them children. Protesters demanded the resignations of government ministers as well as changes to media. More than 400 people are confirmed dead following massive floods in eastern Congo, according to a local official. That count was still provisional as authorities continue their search. Torrential rains began last Thursday with rivers breaking their banks and flash floods sweeping away the majority of homes and buildings in two villages where the most lives were lost. Out of control wildfires have caused evacuations in western Canada as crews battle fires threatening communities in Alberta and British Columbia. In Alberta, officials say the number of evacuees grew to about 29,000 over the weekend after a state of emergency was declared. While some rain and overcast conditions may help, officials warned that hot and dry conditions were predicted to return. Now to an ABC News exclusive. Our Rebecca Jarvis sits down one-on-one -on -one with Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates to look into the future and at the rise of artificial intelligence. For you. Tonight, the ABC News exclusive. Billionaire philanthropist and Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates on his optimism and his warning for Americans on the meteoric rise of artificial intelligence. Are you scared? We're all scared 
that a bad guy could grab it. Uh, let's say the bad guys get ahead of the good guys. Then something like cyber attacks you know, could be driven by an AI. The White House, the administration, regulators here in the US, do you think they're up to speed? Uh, not yet. They're not ready. Not yet. I mean, why are they not ready? You're never going to have every politician understanding it, but how do you build up a capacity to review things? You know, they won't be the experts, but they have to be part of that discussion. Why not put a pause to it while we just figure out some of these very basic things? If you just pause the good guys and you don't pause everyone else, you're probably hurting yourself. You definitely want the good guys to have strong AI. Can you guarantee that? If you stop the good guys, you can guarantee it won't happen. Gates urging caution, but not pausing. We are with him in Kemmerer, Wyoming, about three hours south of Jackson. This is actually the place where the nuclear island will be located. Where he's working on his own innovation, the next generation of nuclear energy with his company, TerraPower, determined to create cleaner, cheaper power and new high-tech jobs. Why are you so committed to nuclear energy? Well, nuclear energy, uh, if we do it right, will help us solve our climate goals. What do you say to the critics who say it's expensive, there are the safety and security issues, and then there's the issue of radioactive waste? Yes. Today's plants are way too expensive. We've solved all the uh, areas where there have been safety challenges, and we have dramatically less waste. But every one of those areas you mentioned, there are valid concerns that TerraPower has to show that, that we've solved. Is everything different 10 years from now? No, not everything. Uh, what people like to do, people wanting jobs in a community uh, like Kemmer, uh, a lot will stay the same. Good to hear that. Our thanks to Rebecca for that. And still to come, showcasing the complexities of being a black woman. My intimate conversation with author Brianna Holt, who writes about being a young black woman in a not so post-racial America. Okay, people, admit it. You love your game shows. I love game shows. We all love game shows. It's showtime. But what don't you know? Just when you thought you knew everything about game shows. A show about game shows. So special. My guilty pleasure. Anything goes. Making whoopee. Oh, it's better than sex. Well, now, Jerry, I'm not sure about all that. Just but it is going to be good. Welcome to the game show. 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 Premiering Wednesday night on ABC. You're welcome. And they stream it on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. In a 1962 speech, Malcolm X stated the most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. And those assertions are echoed in Brianna Holt's debut book, In Our Shoes, on being a young black woman in not-so-post-racial America, drawing from our own personal experiences as well as those of other young black women. Brianna offers a powerful and intimate look into the challenges and complexities facing young black women in America today and joining us now is Brianna Holt. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Why did you feel this book was necessary? 
Um, during the summer of 2020, I saw so many talented black women writers writing and think pieces and articles about our lived experiences, um, really just trying to educate the general public about what we're experiencing and what we're going through. And I was doing the same, and I felt like I wanted to do something a bit more permanent, um, you know, not on an Instagram story that can be, uh, that goes away in 24 hours, or a post that can be archived, or even an article that doesn't have as much longevity. And I feel like um, people don't really realize that the modern day black woman, the young black woman is going through a lot of things that our ancestors, our predecessors went through, um, but it's kind of camouflaged through a lot of first black woman two wins and um, achievements and triumphs. And so I wanted to really explore in this book some of the things that we're experiencing that are often underreported um, or just widely unknown. And obviously this is part memoir, part cultural critique. Uh, many people will say, well, look, why not just talk about the plight of women? What are the specific challenges of black women? Yeah, black women are from early as age five are, adil are black girls are dealing with adultification bias. Um, black boys as well. Black women were also dealing with, you know, hyper sexual, uh, being hypersexualized. Um, we're dealing with colorism. We're dealing with microaggressions in the workplace. We're dealing with medical racism. So a lot of dis different obstacles and struggles and challenges we're experiencing. And obviously you highlight those. You write specifically the adultification, hypersexualization, degradation, and policing of our bodies begins as early as our preteen years and these stereotypes placed on us, which date as far back as colonization, are unavoidable. Talk to me about the impact of these stereotypes on young black women. Yeah, the impact is everything from violence, mental health issues, all the way to death. Um, it's a negative impact, the way that we see ourselves, our self-perception, um, which directly impacts your mental health, um, but also just the harm that is done to us. You know, we are more likely to experience violence as violence can result in death. We are more likely to be neglected, which results in harm in several situations. Um, it affects, it negatively impacts our livelihood when we are highly underpaid, um, highly overworked, et cetera. You write about this idea of being invisible, but at the same time hyper visible. I explain what you mean by that. Yeah, in my book I actually use, I talk about an example that happened to me when I was shopping at the mall with a friend. Um, my friend shoplifted and this experience at the mall was just very eye-opening for me. Um, we were teenagers and I remember um, guys coming up to her, wanting to talk to her at the mall, finding her attractive, or walking into like an Abercrombie or a Hollister where they do a lot of their recruiting from just in the store and people asking, how old are you? We would like you to work here asking, talk, saying this stuff to my white friend um, and kind of me just being invisible, just the friend who's kind of in the background. But as soon as we would start shopping or we would stop at a stand, a sunglasses stand, all of a sudden I became extremely visible, um, trying to make, you know, the questions of, hey, do you need help with anything about five times or is there anything specific you're looking for or just realizing that, oh, I'm being watched. And so I feel like black girls are often going between this situation of being hyper visible and invisible. And in the last chapter, you really talk about the importance of self care as well as community um, support. What would your advice be to that up and coming uh, teen or, or tween who's a black female? To really practice radical self care. I think what we when we think of self care, we think of you know bubble baths and going and getting a massage and things such as that, doing a face mask. But I think for black girls, radical self-care, and self-care just in general is radical because we are choosing to care for ourselves when it is expected for us as black women to really care for the community, care for everyone else. And so finding that group that understands you, humanizes you, sees you for who you are, values you, and keep those people close to you. I think it's radical even for black women to be very specific about um, the people that they let into their circle and protecting their peace. And I wish my younger self and what I would tell younger black girls and black women is to really um, prioritize protecting your peace by all means necessary, whatever that looks like. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Brianna. We appreciate it. Want to let our viewers know that In Our Shoes on Being a Young Black Woman in Not-So-Post-Racial America is available now wherever books are sold. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Okay, people, admit it. You love your game shows. I love game shows. We all love game shows. It's showtime. But what don't you know? Just when you thought you knew everything about game shows. A show about game shows. So special. My guilty pleasure. Anything goes. Making whoopee. <sighs> it's better than sex. Well, now, Jerry, I'm not sure about all that. Just but it is going to be good. Welcome to the game show. show. Premiering Wednesday night on ABC. You're welcome. And they stream it on Hulu. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Brooke Shields, the most photographed woman in the world. A sexualized child model. Exploitation. What happened to her isn't really about hers, it's just about women. I let myself be vulnerable, and this is the first time I've ever spoken about what happened. I thought my one no should have been enough, you know. When someone like Brooke Shields talks about it, it makes a difference. I'm amazed that I survived any of it. Reporting from the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine, I'm Matt Gutman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. This is Nightline. Help me, help me, my wife is dead. Well, the 911 call was pretty eerie. He had just found his wife. Is she breathing at all? Nothing? No, got me, got me. Okay, is she beyond CPR? Yes, yes, just trust me, let him do with my kids. You'll see, you'll see when I get here. And what police did see when they arrived shocked even veteran investigators. Oh my God. Yeah. Now it became a murder for hire. The actual story need to be heard versus to what you heard and what they wanted you to know. In the southern tier of New York, we border on Pennsylvania. It's kind of a rural area. In winter, hockey draws a big crowd around here. You always want to fight someone. Just like when you're a little kid and you get so mad, you just want to fight, you know? Thomas Clayton is a local celebrity. One night after a game, Kelly Stage captures his eye. Within a year, the couple are married and eventually have two children. I thought they were an ideal family. They did everything together. But then one night, Tom Clayton comes home late from a poker game and makes a horrifying discovery. Help me, help me, my wife's dead. How long has she been down? I don't know, I don't know, I just got home. Police were called to the house, their body cameras capturing the horrific scene. Anybody else in the house, Tom, just you? Oh my God, the kids are at the neighbor's house. Okay, where's she at? The victim lay dead on the kitchen floor, her head bashed in, she was hit with some kind of heavy object. It was gruesome. And there was blood spatter pretty much everywhere. Tom, where were you when this all went down? Playing poker with my buddy. Okay. She was home alone? I came home and my daughter said there was a robber in the house and she saw them. He had checked his clothes and his hands. Let me see your hands real quick, man. You ain't hurt or anything? Okay, good. Okay. For any sign of struggle or blood or any other evidence that would indicate he was 
part of this and found none. No, we got blood on the wall, blood on the steps. Looks like she was attacked in bed. There's blood all over. She's been dragged. Blood on the wall. Blood with a hole in the wall. Looks like a face plant into the wall. Her face was basically destroyed. As the night wears on, investigators are combing through everything for evidence. No murder weapon turns up, but they do find suspicious tire tracks. The side door's open, that door's open. No forced entry on the one. Okay. We checked the safe. We checked her jewelry. There was no sign of, of theft at all. When you see that kind of damage, especially to someone's face, uh, it tends to lead you to a crime of passion. While authorities suspected early on this could be a domestic dispute, Thomas Clayton had an alibi. This is where we played poker on Monday evenings, every Monday at 7 o'clock. So take me back to September 28th, 2015. His mind was not into poker, you could tell. Usually he maybe jokes around a lot more, and there was none of that. He was doing a lot of texting on his phone. He was there until the game broke up. And Greg Miller recalled that Thomas left his home at about 12.15 for the 10 to 15 minute ride home. Husband's claiming he was out playing poker. Came home, kid said, Daddy, there was a robbery. Colin was three, Charlie seven, and these poor kids went to bed and woke up and they had lost everything. Life as they knew it was gone. Charlie had witnessed the entire brutal murder of her mother. In her room, she hears her mother yelling, run, Charlie, run. Her mother actually got to her bedroom doorway and may have like actually taken a step inside. Charlie follows the fight. Charlie had told that she had seen somebody hitting her mother with what she described as a, like a white stick. And she kept saying, he did this and he did that. And, and so finally I said, how do you know it's a he? And she said, his eyes look just like daddy's. Those three little words, eyes like daddy, opened a Pandora's box. That was a chilling moment for me. And I knew that I needed some help in this interview. 2020 obtained this video from authorities of Charlie's interview with investigators. Um, there was blood everywhere. Okay. Um, on my door, on the floor, not on the carpet, though. And I thought she was dead when she was lying on the ground. And Daddy was out by cars. We were basically all for like, like 20 minutes. Then he came home and he was like, oh my God. Because he saw my mom. Mm -hmm. okay. So here's a seven-year-old girl that saw one of the most traumatic things you're ever going to see in your life. And she's a smart girl, super smart girl. And I think her mind was trying to work through it and figure out, what did I just see? Thomas Clayton was arrested and charged with the murder of his wife. This description from Charlie of this assailant looking like her daddy, eyes, mask, clothes. He gets charged, largely based upon Charlie's words. Clearly, police knew they still had a lot of work to do. They've now charged Thomas Clayton with the murder of his wife, even though he had a rock solid alibi. When we come back, the investigation takes an unexpected turn. Police discover there was another person in the house. Open the door, walk in, and get the shock of my life. Police here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide